We're creating and presenting this work on black land, the unceded lands of the Gadigal. Sovereignty was never ceded and it always will be Aboriginal land. As a team, we are making a small contribution to the long history of caring for, holding and sharing story on this land and nations across the continent. We pay our respects to the elders that have cared for land, water, air and community to this point and the elders who continue that work today. We recognise the ancestors and histories that are with us in this process from the many nations represented in our team. Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner. It's a sentence that grabs you as soon as you hear it. It's also the title of an amazing play written by Black British writer Jasmine Lee Jones. It's currently on tour in Australia, being produced by Darlinghurst Theatre Company and Green Door Productions. And here we are with an opportunity of a lifetime. Hi, my name is Effie Nkrumah. I'm an interdisciplinary artist and poet. I'm also the lead consultant for community engagement on this Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane tour of Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner. Now, the play deals with diaspora. It deals with all the things that black people have been talking about for centuries, but also things that have come to the forefront in the last 10 to 20 years. Things like racial gaslighting, misogynoir, cultural appropriation, and the commodification of black female bodies. However, I think it's time for us to dig deep in our discussions and start talking about artists, musicians, scholars, and normal everyday people like us who have been talking and thinking and making about the themes that are present in Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner. So here we are. Let's talk about Seven Methods IRL. Action. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Effie. AKA Benuma. Um, so I just want to welcome you all. Say Wezo, Akwaba, okay. and all the other things we say. Bilingual. <laughs> yeah, there's one. I, I remember the South African one and now it's gone. Mm. But um, Saubona, right? Saubona. So thank you for coming through, guys. Um, this is the first episode, I feel, of the seven methods in real life conversations, as we're calling them, or the seven mes- methods IRL. Um, so basically, Basically, everybody that's watching, Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner is a play written by Black British writer Jasmine Lee Jones. Um, it's an amazing show that talks about all the hot spots and the keywords of blackness and diaspora, racial gaslighting, misogynoir, cultural appropriation, and the list goes on. Uh, and it follows two characters, Cleo and Kara in their friendship and journey, um, thinking through these issues and um, how real and close they are to us every day, even though we might not always talk about them. Mm. Um, So today we wanted to delve into a discussion about some art and some writing and amazing scholarship and our own lived experiences that relate directly to the black female body. And that line is repeated so many times in the play um, that it's really important. So before we go ahead, I would love t- our guests to introduce themselves because they're all so amazing from such different walks of life, but I feel like where we intersect will show the beauty of this conversation. So I'm going to start to what is my right, your left, Doc, as I'm going to call her. Mm. (laughs) Please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Camille Denzels Peart. I am Professor of Communication and Media Studies at Roger Williams University on the East Coast of the U.S. So far away, way, way, way. (laughs) Well, you're so welcome and thank you so much for coming through today. I know we'll delve into the nitty gritty and the juice of your amazing work throughout our conversation. So we can't wait. Um, And so next. You can go first. Our kind. Uh, My name is Mary, Um, Ghanaian born Australian. Uh, Wait, Australian Ghanaian born? Yeah. How would you call that? Anyway, <laughs> I'm I'm born in Australia, but my um my parents are from Ghana. I'm Ghanaian. Um, I'm part of a little podcast called Fufu and Tibs. Shameless plug. And little, little. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's basically me. I am Leo. Um, I'm a visual artist, uh, Australian born as well, and. 
that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right, cool. We can handle that. <laughs> so welcome once again, you guys. Um, and I hope we have a really fun conversation. I just want to give a shout out quickly to our team. Reynolds, Blake, Shetu. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, Shetu will probably, I'll ask her questions through this and she'll probably squeeze in. So thanks for being here. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to read a very quick quote um, and then we can get started. So um, it comes from Burton Benedict and it's in a really great anthology that I've been looking at called Black Venus or they called her Hottentot. Um, and this kind of talks about, um, well, it's a bunch of essays really edited by the amazing artist, photographer, everything, Dr. Deborah Willis. Um and uh, it really focuses on Sarah Bartman or Saki, Sarah, Sehura, many names. Um, and she's really core to the story of or what the play Seven Methods is trying to talk about and the commodification of black female bodies. Mm. Um, so this quote says, few pastimes are more amusing than looking at other people. A study of visitor behaviour in public parks shows that people spend more time looking at each other than at the beauties of nature. If the people observed differ in some striking fashion from the observer, interest is further stimulated. For centuries, entrepreneurs and showmen have been charging admission to see human oddities. Human oddities. And I found that interesting. <laughs> Purely because there's an idea that human, I guess, and I feel in this case is whiteness and anything other than that becomes an oddity. Um, so I guess I'd like to open the conversation with that. Um, how you guys feel if you felt the same way. Um, and our main question when Shetu and I d were discussing was what does a black woman look like? It sounds vague, but maybe take a second think through. What does a black woman look like to you guys? Anyone can jump in. <laughs> There's no one. That it's. I can't capture it because we're so diverse. From your hair type to your tone, even undertones. There's there's yellow undertones. There's olive like. Uh, obviously our hues are very different so and our body types are extremely different so there's no one you know vision that comes to mind when I think of a black woman to be honest but because of my bias and because I'm a Ghanaian you know woman I tend to think for some reason it's always you know kinky coily hair if I'm gonna really be honest like but in the back of my head I know that it's there's just such a plethora of ways that we present ourselves as black women, but kinky coily hair, you know, dark mahogany skin. Uh, and that's just really because purely where I'm from, you know, um, and not to mention, you know, Melanesian, Polynesians, you know, people of indigenous um, descent that identify as black as women as well. So it's just too diverse. Yeah. Yeah. It's very diverse. I agree with Mary, I think that that the even the idea that we can be thinking of one singular black woman to represent the entire range of black womanhood, even that is a part of the kind of you know oppressive systems that are used to define blackness. The fact that we need to show up in one particular way. And that way isn't even defined. We don't even get to define that in many cases, right? Like blackness tends to be defined outside of black spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, and the again, just the idea that we have to show up as a particular thing in a particular way, that is not even that's not just like you said, Mary, that's not a part of our community. We live in families where people have different kinds of hair, different kinds of shade, different kinds of whatever, but when we when we are moving around a white supremacist space or white supremacist spaces, mm -hmm. you're expected to show up and model blackness in one particular way. And that's very limiting, it's dehumanizing, mm -hmm. it erases all kinds of complexities that black people have, black women in particular have. So um, yeah, so I agree with you, Mary, that we come in 
we can't, we are many. <laughs> we, we are many <laughs> and to try to um, minimize, minimize us to one thing or one set of things is actually a part of the oppression. Mm-hmm. Oh, agreed. Yeah, I have nothing to say on that. Hey, because they hit it on the spot. Like, it's everything. Yeah. yeah. It's everything. I don't know. Yeah, it's everything. I've seen many different black women. So, yeah. It's I think that's so liberating for me to hear that. And the reason I say that is I feel it shows that for us, we are thinking through our diversity without necessarily articulating that all the time. Yeah. Um, and I feel like just to to dip into this, um, one, the re- one of the reasons why um, I thought it was important to have Doc in this conversation is because your work focuses on blackness in diaspora in the Caribbean. And um, I feel like what's happening now with this play and with all the conversations, the Fufu and Tips um, podcast and just all the work, your work, your photography, what we're saying is that we're thinking about what blackness actually is and should be. And like you said, Doc, about the idea of who is defining blackness. Mm. And so for me, like that was really important to know that we are all like, actually the diversity is necessary. It is real. And our minds are not as closed off or as limited as perhaps it seems they are in terms of saying, oh, a black woman is X, Y, Z. And I feel like that's us pulling away from this very US centric um, framework that we've been handed down, especially yeah. in an Australian context yes. um, that I thought we were all sort of just riding with. Mm, <laughs> but yep. I see that we're breaking out of that. So I don't know if any of you have thoughts on that to share. Yeah, I think just as a black man, um, yeah, black women uh, or have been uh, perceived to us, or I'll say, in my world of like the creative field and like photography and videos and stuff yeah most of the time like the black women look a particular way they take off a good amount of boxes that give off some type of people would call it ideal black women to the world you know yeah that's which I don't agree with and I don't think that's what it is, but that's what it has become. Yeah, definitely. And most of the music we are listening to naturally, if not US is now UK also as well, but yeah, definitely US derived hugely the wrong ideal context of a black woman. Yeah. It's like zero point something percent of like what black women are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's low. It's pretty low. I've seen many different black women. <laughs> and they're not the ones in the videos. <laughs> Ooh. You know? <laughs> they're not the ones in the videos. They're not the ones. And I take photos. So, like, I've seen many black women mm. who haven't had their photos also taken. You know what I mean? But, yeah, it's the society that we live in, of course. So, that's my two cents on that. Yeah. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I'm like, somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, do, what do you think? <laughs> I think it goes back to what Dr. Camille is saying about how our blackness is constructed out of out of black spaces. So a lot of the time, you know, you hear terminologies like red bone and, you know, particular hair types and, you know, particular hues of skin that is kind of projected as you know, if you're using visual as the main source of something, you're going to use something that's desirable to the eye. So for them, something desirable to the eye is palatable to white people, which is, you know, a red bone girl with like maybe three C hair and a big ass booty. So, or maybe not, maybe a little bit slimmer because that's more appealing. Um, But I just think going off what you said, yes, it's very much something that, you know, I think growing up here because we're fed a lot of that yep. US type of um, 
thought behind what a black woman is, if I probably, if I wasn't Ghanaian or if I wasn't really tapped into the Ghanaian side, I would probably believe that that's yep. what I should look like. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, definitely. which is very damaging. Yeah. Yeah, and especially living in this white space as an Austra- like Australian African, you know, we don't see each other, like we don't see each, each no. other on TV. No. Like there's... 0.0 black people on TV. So and the fact is too that even there was there's there was never a moment where when uh white Europeans encountered black women that they defined black womanhood in any kind of positive way. Mm. I mean there's lots of research that shows that even when they went to the continent the the, the, women, the people that they encountered there they described them as animals I mean, I mean they would describe their breasts hanging down and they look like they're insects and they have you know look like they have you know six legs and so so even even if the idea of what a black woman should look like in white supremacy has shifted over time it has never had any kind of love in it it has never had any kind of positive way of thinking about black women's bodies and so the the construction um around black women's bodies even today and it may be coming out it's very it's very eurocentric but it is very old and it's very deep this is something that was that was established even before the colonizers touched soil in africa Mm -hmm. and so this is what we're living with right like we're still living with with these ideas about black womanhood that were created by largely white men and you know through the lens of of anti-blackness and so that's that's what that's what we live with and we do try to within black communities right so we we have we have we construct ideas about you know what's an attractive black woman right like I, I hear I heard you talking about that like what does it mean to be an attractive and desirable and many black women and many black men <laughs> desire black women that are curvy with the you know big hips and the protruding but and the tiny waist and Right. So, so there's a it, within our communities, we construct ideas about what is what is attractive, what is and we put some positivity, you know, next to it. But again, still, that doesn't displace the ways in which white supremacy still position black women. How do you see yourself, my fellow black woman? How does society see you? Have you ever thought about this and how these ideas of what society knows affect how you portray yourself in the world? How you see yourself? What do you see? So as I'm listening, I'm like, yeah, I agree with everything, but I just want to maybe throw a spanner in the works of the question is if that's how... And I, and I don't know if it's for us to answer or just, <laughs> I don't know. But I feel like if that's how um, history's written us, because I've seen some of those accounts and they <laughs> one about, um, I think actually that was in your video, um, a woman throwing her boob over her shoulder to feed her child and stuff. And I thought, well, if that's how they felt, then how is it? Harking back to the play, which um, I believe you guys have seen, how is it then that the same aesthetics are praised or imitated by white women? And does that mean that, um, you know, we know about the desire desirability politics, like jump in if, I, yeah, like, you know, we, mm. we know that we're technically at the bottom of the 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 rung mm-hmm. and and yet the the features seem to work for for white mm-hmm. uh, do, do you get my confusion here of yeah, course yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely even like personally growing up i was a busty girl i had a big bum like when i was in school like the comments that i were, were made were never that you know, I'm an attractive girl. It's like, oh, she has a big bum. She has nice boobs. It's like, there's literally, you've literally mentioned 2% of my body. <laughs> what about this money maker? Like, come on. But it's always just been something like the assets or just the features. 
are desirable, but us in our entirety is not. And I felt like that's something that was always like drilled into me. Like just, it's my features that kind of make me look desirable. So if those same features are on a white girl, then of course they're going to think, oh, delicious. You yeah. know, they're going to think that she's like the epitome of like, you know, femininity, sexuality, like everything that's supposed to be desirable in a woman. But I just don't know how that occurred along the way. But I mean, yeah, I, I feel like the whole thing is ca- uh, it's like it's the uh, yeah, there's head. a flip because yeah. at a point in time I was reading a lot about this stuff because I was confused. Yeah. And I remember re- seeing this um, hashtag called um, hashtag white girls evolving. And I was like, but if they're going to technically historically backwards, how are they evolving? <laughs> like by and and it was all, like I if you google it today there's a you'll see it like it's it's the the Sarah Bartman Kylie Jenner like uh, mm. Kim Kardashian shape and lips and the with the you know mm. um and so what i find interesting is we both grew up here um but i i almost had the opposite experience in sydney where i had a lot of people teasing me with the why do you walk like a duck and like you know little white boys literally imitating my walk and I always say I don't have many overtly racist experiences here it's always the undercurrent the microaggression ones but those are the clearest memories of moments where I I was suddenly aware of what I looked like to other people um and those those were hard times like literally going to the shop to buy jeans with my mom and when I was young hipsters were in fashion and so I was buying clothes that were you know two or three sizes bigger than me because Mm. that was all that would fit over my hips and backside and I'd still have that awkward like gap gap. (laughs) so I I had to wear belts and and I feel like what that did was like forced me to form an identity where I I overgave personality wise and like was hiding in my clothes literally then I get to Ghana and it's like why do you dress like that (laughs) why aren't you showing your your shape shape. you have signs and wonders and (laughs) Back to the two percent and wonders. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Back yeah. to the two percent and the yeah. and I was confused. I didn't believe people that I was attractive. I did. I still don't. When people say you're pretty, I'm like, you are lying. Mm. Cause I confusion. So yeah, I'm chucking my confusion out for y'all to discuss. <laughs> no, yeah. But going off. No, no, no. I was just going to say I, I did get the other side of the stick, obviously. You know, a lot of teasing about your bum. Why is it so big? Mm-hmm. But what. I'm just saying in relation to, you know, how it's now being perceived as something to be glorified. It was like by girls. And when I was like in my teenage years, it, it did start coming up. Oh, like you have a nice bum or like you have like nice boobs. But like that was it. Do you know what I mean? So it's just, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Yeah, anyway. I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> so I Googled sugar baby and I also Googled sugar mama. And I will not lie, I was actually shocked (laughs) at the images I saw. I don't know what I was expecting to see, but sugar mamas have a very specific body shape that can be and is usually red as black and voluptuous, small waist, big backside, big boobs. It was honestly surprising to me. But it's also made me think a lot about the history of miscegenation and how black women were viewed by colonial masters and slave owners. And putting the idea of a sugar baby in comparison with a sugar daddy in terms of what comes up on Google images, that was a moment. So what you're both highlighting is really that's the contradiction that black women live in, right? Like the the uh, we there are black communities where even if it doesn't fully manifest itself in the kinds of power that black that everyday black women have in their lives, there's a space within black communities where you know the curvy body is celebrated. Um, 
So I live in the United States now, but I was born and raised in Jamaica. And dance hall is all about the body, right? Like dance hall is all about, you know, having, you need to have a certain kind of body to even whine, to even dance. You need to have a certain kind, a certain kind of body. So there are spaces within Black communities that appreciate, um, it doesn't go far enough, you know, to, to, you know, guarantee our liberation, but there's some <laughs> appreciation for it. And then the a part of why that when you spaces though you opposite kind of reaction to your body because then the the while in you know in many um black societies and black communities the na narratives around the curvy body is you know she is attractive she is you know sexy and she looks nice the narrative around a curvy body in white supremacy space is she is hypersexual. Mm -hmm. She doesn't deserve to be protected. She can totally be victimized and raped and she's okay because she asked for it because of her body. And so we live in between these two kinds of um, ideas and, and they, they clash a little bit more. They are, I think they clash even in spaces because when I was in Jamaica, I, I understood that there was a thinness that was expected, um, but, but I could always, Put it aside and said that's for white people <laughs> white people right white people want to be that thin um uh, so, so it's there but when you're in the diaspora when you're in african diaspora is and that contradiction you we live it in in every day like we we walk in it we live it you it can shift from one moment you're at home and your parents are telling you that you're not eating enough because you're too slim and you need to put on weight and you go to school or you go on your campus and somebody's telling you that your body is out of place mm -hmm. right so you're highlighting the contradictions that we experience as black women in african diasporas <laughs> society wants us to be one thing whilst culture and tradition calls us to be another. Where do we stand? Where is the middle ground? Is there one at all? Car and Clear grapple these thoughts and then some in seven methods. Well, I feel like this takes us to the artwork we wanted to talk about today, which is um, Kara Walker's A Subtlety. Um, I don't think I need to, we can put it up. Yeah. Um, and that is, or what is it? A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby. Um, so my first question in regards to that one was, when each of you saw that sculpture, um, I don't know how, I've not asked how familiar you are with it, Doc, so I would love to hear your thoughts. But when you did see the image, I'd love to know like first thoughts, reactions, like how you felt when you saw it. Leo is burning to see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just thought this was hard. I was like, this is hard. I was just like, this is like, this, I, when I saw it, I was like, this is what I've known. But it's it, now it's like, a sculpture mm -hmm. and it's like being displayed and like this but this is what I've known but like there's gonna be so many people that wouldn't know that this is what people have known as like normal in their house like this is normal to me like from what I saw like that's so normal to me it's so normal that like I was like it was like I was seeing the women in my life on a pedestal like they were being put on a pedestal like so this is what you look like if you're blown up and this is how beautiful you are so just know that if you are blown up and you're put on display for people to really see just naturally what you are not just like not realize you as a black woman naturally walking bars, we're blowing you up and this is what you look like so maybe you should also see this as well but yeah when i saw it, i was just like yeah this is this is hard this is like so I'm looking at my mom, I'm looking at my ancestors. I may not know them, but like, I'm seeing my people, like, and I get it. I got, it. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was like amazing. I have a big, like, huge appreciation for like, um, like women being displayed as they are, you know, not, not like cut up, not like Photoshop, not like surgery, not like all those things. Not that I'm against like those things because 
I've done those things before. Like, you know, in Photoshop, I've had to clean people's faces and do things like that. But like, when I saw it, I was just like, yeah, this is like, this is general, this is natural, and this is our world too. I was like, this is from our world, and this is what it actually looks like when you don't do anything to it. And it's just display that as it is. Yeah. It's beauty to me at the end of the day. Like, all hands down. Yeah, that was my take on it. I was a little bit more ambivalent about, not ambivalent, I was more, I, I had conflicting um, emotions like simultaneously. And I think maybe uh, that's that's also one of the aims of Kara Walker is to, is to make you have all of these different feelings. So on one hand, I hear you, Leah, I was, uh, I was like, this is so powerful. It's so big. It's so colossal. It's taking up so much space. It's so powerful. It's such a, it's such a powerful imagery um, that and, and a and a powerful representation of black women um, and and many of like you said many of the black women that we know right like our mothers our aunties our cousins it wasn't that was never me though I, I mean you can't tell but <laughs> I never had a, <laughs> and a history I had my own challenges with growing up being what Jamaicans would call a maga. A, a slender, you know, black woman. So I had my own kind of <laughs> issues around that, but I recognize it. So, so you're right that I recognize, um, uh, I recognize many black women, a body, many black women's body in in that, and saw that it was powerful. And I was like, why not? Why not have a naked a representation of a naked black woman take up all this space? and be so powerful and like a sphinx, right? Like, it's, and it's so regal. On the other hand though, I mean, a part of me also wanted to go and like cover it up, like cover up, cover up her butt. I don't want him to look at her like the, cover it up because it, we're, we're historically, we have been in a position so often where we don't have any control uh, how, uh, over how our bodies are displayed yeah. and who gets to gawk and touch. And, and I'm like, cover her up because, <laughs> Because I, I don't want to give satisfaction, particularly white people. And the video that I saw, it was mostly white people who went to visit, right? Like mostly white people who went there. And so part of me was saying, all right, let's just, you don't, you don't get to look. You don't get to do the same thing that you've done to Bartman and other women. You don't get to do that. So I was very, I, I had conflicting emotions um, when I saw it, my reactions. Um, were very strong but very conflicting. I agree with you too. I do. Yeah, I do. I do agree with you on that. I definitely do agree with you. When I see things like that, like everything I say is true. But yeah, like I feel like we can't stop pain from mm. like you know arising in us. Mm. We can't stop pain from like arising in us. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's a, it's a long line. It's mm. a long line. So like. Even like the, yeah, the like head wrap, the head wrap yeah. like, like when I saw it, I was just like, yeah, I see the pain, but let me go look for beauty. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I, I felt like, I felt tired for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In that, like um, having to maintain, like if she was physically posing that way, like it was a real person, like it's that constant, um, we're always working. Like, you know, for me, like the head wrap was like, she's been in the kitchen mm. or in the sugar fields or wherever working. Mm. And then the face is like, to me, not not so relaxed, but it's, it's kind of like a pose. Yeah. Um, and then the entire position is is work. It's it's hard work. And I feel like that that is, um, if I'm being like very, in the depths of my like not so positive side, it felt like that's the daily thing of black women. Like we're always working Preach. and it's like, and that's what makes us desirable or not desirable. Oh, you, you got a girl. Does she clean? Does she cook? Does she, can, is she good in bed? Okay. If she doesn't cross all those things next, mm. but then mediocrity in any of those levels for other women mm. is like, it's okay. You, you give them grace. Yeah, yeah. And, and we don't have that grace. Mm -hmm. And um, without jumping into something else, I feel like what you've just said, Mary, is what I think then 
then manifests in diaspora in terms of conversations of like relationships, like the tropes and the stereotypes. Black women have attitude, they're angry, da da da. Black men are, nah, 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 nah. and it's because we're all expecting each other to do so much work mm -hmm. just to reach a level of palatability with each other. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, it's like the I always have to cover my hair when I go outside if it's not if it's not freshly braided or weaved or whatever, I can't just walk out. I can't because respectability politics are so ingrained mm. culturally and in terms of col colonial lily. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I love the sculpture, but it's, it's, I, I feel tired. Mm. Wow. That's deep. That's really deep. Becky. Um, I think I was with Dr. Camille on that one. I thought, it's beautiful and obviously the merging with the Sphinx and the regalness, I could see that, but I saw the other side, which is just like, oh, you know, like how, like, couldn't you just at least put a little bit something on the bum? Like, I don't know, for some reason I just thought, oh, like cover up a little bit. And it's, I think it just stems down. I didn't really understand why I felt like that. Mm. And I think Dr. Camille kind of just shed a light on me and it's really just because I felt like you know we need to be protected like our bodies need to be protected so as beautiful it was as it was I even thought to myself oh this would make like if I had a mini edition like and could just put it on my mantle this would be beautiful um but in that full glory and it's like colossality like it's just big it's huge <laughs> it's massive I was just like oh just everyone gawking it was just uncomfortable me feeling like people are gawking at her that's that's where it came uh, and the expo like the exposure right like just being so exposed and I suppose that's a part if we you know if, if Kara Walker could say that she'll probably say that that's a piece of it wanting to show mm -hmm. the, the, the vulnerability of black women in these spaces, right? Like not being able to be in control over their bodies, where their bodies are, where they position their bodies are, even how their bodies are represented. Mm -hmm. There, because it, it's it's you, it's it's the you know the the, the front part is the mammy with the with yeah. the head tie, yeah. and then the back part is the hypersexualized. Those are yeah. the two, um, like you were saying, Effie. Those are the the two kind of ways in which black women are seen in you know problematically in dominant society and and so it's like um I, I do think that she wanted to show the vulnerability uh black women can be and how uh, and 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 knowing that they don't necessarily have any kind of control and as a black woman in the in the space though right like as a black woman experiencing this sculpture I felt that too for myself and so I wanted to I felt a little bit like they were gawking at, as you said, Mary, they're gawking at her. Um, and maybe it's because I can see my, you know, my aunties in it and I can see my great grandma and my, maybe it's because I can see people in my communities in that sculpture. Um, and that may contribute to me just wanting to uh, protect her and to, um, yeah, and to protect her just, yeah. It was very, it was a, I, I had not um, seen the sculpture before now. And so when you mentioned it and I went and I looked and I saw videos on it and how it was made and, and it was, I, I mean, the, the process of making it itself was just, uh, again, so it was, it was mostly seen by, when it was done, it was mostly seen by white people and it was mostly white men who built it. It was so, it was tripping me up a little bit when I saw it. <laughs> Mm. Oh, I, I didn't know that part. That's Stop interesting. Me. Yeah. So what is, what, what was it like for, it, it was, it just put me in, in, like, I had all kinds of emotions seeing the, it was, certain, you know, designed by Kara Walker for sure. Yeah. And, you know, she, she did the, she, she, her, it's her thought brought to life, but in the actual construction. So you saw white men like carving out her, you know, her breast, and they, they were the ones that shaped her butt. And I was just like, this is really so um, many things. It's just many things. <laughs> it's, all, it's a lot. <laughs> you know, thinking about the protect, hmm, protection side of it, um, I've obviously been reading a lot about Sarah Bartman through this process. Um, and I realized that 
in a lot of the, you know, um, you speak about how there are legends and myths when you talk about Nanny of the Maroons. And it's interesting because when I see Nanny's picture, it's always just um, her bust. And so you can't actually imagine what her body looked like. Um, but what I found interesting was that Sarah or Saki insisted on not being naked. But in the myth and legend, as her stories retold, it's told as if she was. Um, but in many of the accounts I've read, it was like she 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 was so um, insistent that I, I can stand up there or whatever, but I'm not taking my clothes off. Um, and so they constructed that skin tight um, suit for her so that she would be as close to. And I, I believe culturally with uh, the Khoisan, they uh, do cover with a cloth as well and so the her whole costume was like really we'd like to have you butt naked but if you say so um well the first ever skims (laughs) exactly (laughs) my goodness exactly oh my god exactly and so i feel like the protection thing is um like in i know Mm. the word like it's kind of like you wouldn't see... There's a line in the play where um, Cleo says, um, you know, and there were cusses to for little to make little black kids feel ugly, little black girls feel ugly. And it's like, you just wish you could rustle up all the little black yeah. girls you see and just give them all, like, a hug. Yeah. Um, I'm rambling. Forgotten <laughs> my point, but... Point we're with you, we're with you. Yeah. We're with you. Point is, mm-hmm. I feel like there's something very strong... Uh, to do with um, protection and like where uh, where a black woman woman will try her absolute best to like draw a line at a point, mm. and I feel like like the question now is like what do you feel that is like what is that point now where those aesthetics are now it's now a good thing like it's to wear the the bodysuit and the you know and to wear the um, What's it called now? Waist trainer. Yeah, I was going to say body trainer. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, and girls, and you find girls across, not just diaspora, but on the continent, like the industry for butt plumping and fake hipping and... It's incredible. And that's also a thing that I was kind of thinking about because this BBL culture that's come about and you see... You know, all these little videos on Instagram and they're all in like the Dominican Republic and they're all just like lined up and they're all like just sitting in Yo, that stuff looks wild. I'm like, how? But we're the originals. So why are you going to Dominican Republic to go and enhance it more? Like, is it because now it's become palatable for for non-blacks? I'm just going to say non-blacks to have, you know, the small waist, big bum. And now it's kind of like, okay, let me prove to you now that we also, like, I can outdo. I just I, I don't understand, like, the the psychology behind now a lot of the BBL trend within, I would probably say mostly American culture, but that's the one that we're exposed to the most down here. But, I mean, like, you know, you know I've bought a waist trainer here and there as well. So now I'm just like, how now now that it's palatable for white girls are we now enhancing already what we have it's like when yeah like are we trying to look like white girls now i don't understand like we're never enough for some like for some reason you know when we're the originators i mean you've never been told that you were enough so oh chile (laughs) you know yeah you were never told that you were enough ever from the beginning and so that's like derived through generations and years of not being told that you're enough to the point where your parents were a part of it. Was it their fault? Not really. Mm. From their parents, also putting on them, down to you guys, to the point where, like, I'm sure when you were shopping with your mom, your mom would have said things most probably that, like, she either would have got herself from her mother or maybe from her auntie, or maybe from her grandmother, that she wouldn't even have known or understood what they were saying to her. And now she's just saying it to you. Let that sit with you for just a moment. You are enough. I feel like for her it was a painful process. 
because well, there was that means one that she day knew. like that we means went that she into knew. Yeah. yeah like yeah. you know the shops here back then just jeans to JJ's to yep. this to that yep. and then it was like none of the above yep. you're not going to go into Maya because like, <laughs> we don't have the, Maya money it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah like at that time like you were not buying designer jeans yeah. you know I remember and I, I think it was heartbreaking for her to see me crying because yeah. Like the jeans just do not fit, no. and and I'm short, I'm petite too, so like it's gonna be too long too. Mm. Like it was just a hot, it was it a was, mess. It was really it was a, a constant mess. mess. So like by the time, I think for her, and and I feel like that's a thing for a lot of diasporan parents dealing with all this is like, how what do I do for my child? Like the aesthetics here are so opposite to GH, and Ghana is a place where. I remember one of the first things I was confronted with was like how confident girls who here would have been like totally mm. insecure mm-hmm. because their sake is different. Hairy legs is a good thing. Mm. Okay, nobody's shaving their legs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like chunky, chunky, um, like ankles is a good thing. And like all the keywords were different. When someone's like, oh, you've got some fats, like it's not an insult. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like, oh yeah, you're, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's like, uh-huh, now we, yeah, <laughs> something to hold. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like for the, for our parents, it, it was harder because it's like the aesthetics are different. They don't even know how to navigate that language Uh oh. because it's like, I've never had to tell my child, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like they were just as confused. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is why. Oh, I was going to say that this is why it's, it's, um, this is why it's important to um, to look at, you know, like what, what we call the intersectionality of blackness, right? So mm-hmm. it's okay to talk about black people overall, but also giving like a like sustained attention to black women and black girls is important because there are things around our bodies that we encounter that, that black men will not encounter in the same way. Mm-hmm. And a part of, so a, a part of the whole, the you know, what is beautiful and beauty standards and generally those things are imposed on women, women generally, uh, you know, of different races, different societies. There, is the, there are these beauty standards that, that are imposed. And, and when you are a black woman, you experience not only racism through you know, because of the color of your skin, I know you also have to contend with these beauty expectations, right? Like expectations that I need to look a certain way and which will, you know, prompt you to get the waist trainers and no judgment, no judgment, Mary, I want the waist, no judgment here. <laughs> but you, you know, you prompt to get the waist trainers or you feel like you need to plump up because there are these expectations around um, women's bodies overall and specifically black women's bodies that that, that you have to look a certain way in order to be, be identified as woman. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, you know, black feminists, for example, are paying a lot of attention. Well, I mean, that was a call of black feminists that we, we need to be able to, it's not to say that, that, that black women are more important than black men, not at all, but that the, the, the racism and the combination of racism and sexism and patriarchy and col- in black women's lives than it does in black men's lives. Hmm. I agree. <laughs> Definitely. Oh my gosh. Um, unfortunately, our time's up. Oh no. I mean, mm. I feel like we're just getting into the nitty gritty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just want to say thank you so much to all three of you. Um, Dr. Camille will be um, putting your books, um, Romancing Voluptuousness. I can't say that word, voluptuousness, <laughs> um, which I'm like, I'm trying to get that. <laughs> and so um, we'll be putting that up on our Seven Methods World Bookshop um, soon. And I'm um, just trying to, you know, get people talking about this in, in the diaspora and context a bit more because I feel like we have so much to offer. Um, and thank you so much for your time and for like, just all of it. Yeah, it's really Thank you great. for having me. This is really fun and um, and energizing. Mm. It's almost 2.30 and I'm, and I'm wide awake. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It was thank an you. honor. Thank, thank you. you. 
Leo, Mary, thank you so much. This has been great. Um, and everybody watching, just um, let's keep the conversation going in as many forms as we can. This is the only way I feel that we can progress, grow and build our own identity as free as possible from everything that's been like chucked on us. And I feel like in, as Aussies, as black black diaspora and Aussies, like it's our job to do that for the future generations as well. So that's my little plug there. Go check out Seven Methods of Killing Kyla Jen Jenner. It's showing at Dullyhurst Theatre Company until the 20th of February, 2022. If you're in Brisbane, Melbourne, it is coming to you. So sit tight, get involved in the Seven Methods world. Thanks to my team again. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>